You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. Mayor Greg Ballard has graced us with his presence. I can't believe it. It's our very first podcast. There's nobody I'd want to talk to more to get everything started than the mayor. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Great to be here, Robert. I appreciate it. Well, Being your first. Well, you know, you working for you changed my life, and I wouldn't be doing this podcast or have my own little PR company if it wasn't for you. So I wanted to talk to you first, first to say thank you. Uh, not only for everything that you've done for me and for so many others of us who are out there at the city as a whole, but I want to ask lots of questions about what you're doing now and then talk a lot about what you accomplished as mayor and kind of how you got there. So whenever you're ready. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, you can say what you want about me, but I would suggest to you that you and uh, one other young lady uh, really helped me out during the transition and really put that on the rock steady uh, ground. So, and you came uh, at a very crucial time within a couple of days after that election when <laughs> we were trying to figure out what, uh, what was going on. But uh, I, I think we had it in hand, but uh, you, with uh, your ability to handle everything that was coming in on the communication side, and Jennifer Piercy, God uh, lover, was a, a master organizer and really helped out in that regard. And the two of you really put us on great, great firm ground. Well, I appreciate that. It was uh you know, it was one of those experiences as, as someone who was running the elections for Marion County in 2003 when um, Robert Peterson won by 28 percentage points, beat Greg Jordan, who was a terrifically respected great guy, uh, was Marion County treasurer at the time. I really thought there would be Democrat mayors for decades in a row. I really did and was somewhat envious of a lot of my, I had some friends up there, really good people, actually. Steve Campbell, Justin Oldmiller, uh, Michael Connor. Good folks. I mean, the list goes on and on. Peterson really did have a terrific staff. And I thought, man, what it would be like to work up there, but I'll never know. I'll never know. And uh, let's start right there. It's 2007, it's November, and it's election day. Did you wake up thinking that you would be the next mayor of Indianapolis? I did, uh, because uh, I actually thought that the last two weeks. Uh, I was very, uh, I was confident. I didn't have any money, as you may recall. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and there was a whole thing going on there that uh, we can get into if you want to, but uh, I, I was able to spend very little cash, uh, most of the, probably two-thirds of the cash that I actually did get, maybe 200000 overall, uh, really came in the last couple of weeks when people figured out something was up. But I, I had a lot of people telling me things. I had a lot of Democrats whispering in my ear uh, certain things. And that's why I knew something was up. And I actually told uh, somebody who became really a, a close friend and, uh, and who, uh, you know, uh, who became a really good partner in the, with us in the city. I won't mention his name, but um, I told him, you're going to be the first phone call I make after the election. I told him that four days before the election. And that was, uh, and I did, he was the first phone call I, that I made. And I was pretty confident going into it. The rest of the city wasn't so confident, but I was pretty confident. Well, I didn't think you had a chance in hell, uh, quite <laughs> I think frankly. Was, I think that was the general notion. Too. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, I remember coming up to you, first time I met you was at Republican headquarters. And the, you, I had a jacket on. which State was where, headquarters, right? County. County, okay. County, because I was talking to Kyle Walker, uh, who's a political genius, along with Tom John, who... Tom John's knowledge of this county when it comes to politics is amazing. Right up there with Jennifer Hollowell and quite frankly, guys like Joel Miller and Ned Tracy and others, but on the other side. But anyway, and I had my meritorious service medal lapel pin on from the military and you knew exactly what it was. And it was the first time I'd met you. And I just said, you know, if you need anything from me, Robert Vane, I work at state party. This is what I do. I don't know what kind of staff you have. And you looked at me like, dude, you haven't been paying attention because I have no staff. <laughs> And, but let me know how I can be helpful. And I think I wrote a couple of speeches for you and did like a debate prep 
and you were always very kind. And I candidly never thought, never thought you had a chance until that same time frame that you discussed. I had a conversation with, with Kyle Walker and I'm like, what's, you know, what's it like? What's it going to be like? So on and so forth. What's your prediction? And, and I remember Kyle, who was executive director of the Marion County Republican party at the time. And Tom John was chairman. He goes, man, I think this dude's going to win. He'd been telling me a while for a while he thought the council was going to flip. Right. And I was like, you cannot be serious. Like, really? If Peterson went negative on you. And we don't want to, you know, belabor that point. But but other than the fact that that told everybody else. That's exactly right. Something's up because you, no one goes negative unless they're in trouble. That's exactly right. And so I remember being um, that day just getting that feeling. So. You woke up thinking you were going to win. What was that day like as it went into the night and the victory, what became a victory celebration at the Mira? Yeah, it's hard to uh, overestimate the feeling of that celebration, frankly. But uh, getting up that day, I was actually pretty confident at that point in time, but I was anxious. It still has to execute, right? And it was a very, very, very cold day. I don't know if you remember that or not, but I remember it. Uh, very well, my uh, my brother, who looks like me, was out working the polls outside. As with me, <laughs> he said four people came up to him that day and hugged him and said, "I want to hug the next mayor of Indianapolis." They thought <laughs> they thought yeah, he was uh, he was me, but um, but I was uh, frankly I was uh, I was relieved when I went into the county headquarters and I saw Doris Ann Sadler there because she had been the clerk, mm -hmm. she knew exactly what was going on. She was going to make sure that everything was uh, was going to be uh, executed appropriately across the county uh, as the votes came in. That made me feel really, really good and really solid. And also told me that the party thinks this is this is, might happen also. So I, I we started preparing for that uh, at that point in time. But I was like I say I was pretty confident in the last couple of weeks that things were going to happen, even though I had no money to poll. But I did. I was uh, the feeling that I was getting from both Republicans and, De and Democrats in the city was that this was going to happen. And slating was 10 months before it's January or February or whatever it was. I think it was maybe January of 2007. What made you decide to care enough? I mean, in an era where everyone on Twitter is, you know, both Pope and Playmate of the Month, right? I mean, they're experts on everything. And Facebook, a lot of people have something to say. That's a big difference than having being willing to do something what made you decide you know 23 years in the marine corps you had a, a nice little life going wonderful wife beautiful kids i mean this isn't an easy decision what made you go you know what i'm i'm willing well there's a bit of a story here you know it'll, it'll take a couple minutes but uh, i had a couple of people ask me to run for mayor and i said are you sure uh, nobody who's really one person was kind of connected to the party the other one not at all he said you have the skill set that uh you should be the mayor of Indianapolis. And by the way, no one's running on the Republican side. So uh, maybe you need to look at this thing. And I said, so I did actually, uh, I wasn't planning on being the mayor, but it never entered my mind until they had talked to me, which was either late 06 or early 07. I'm not sure which it right. was. And so I, I called up the County chairman at the time. And I said, which was not Tom John at the time, mm -mm. I called him up and I said, listen, I'm being told I should run for mayor. What do you, <laughs> what do you think? He goes, <laughs> I remember exactly where I was. Uh, I left a message. He calls me back on Friday, the day before the original slating. Uh, and I was at the golf show at the convention center. And he, he called me back. And say, I said, uh, should I go tomorrow? He says, sure. He said, we're not going to slate the mayor tomorrow. We're going to slate the counselors in every other office, but we're not going to slate the mayor because we don't really know who's going to be the candidate. Right. But he said, come on in. And uh, I said, should I bring anything? He said, sure, bring bring a little one-pager about yourself. So that night, about 1130, I typed something out about myself and went a little one-pager. Uh, made 700 copies. And the next morning, me and another guy put them on all the chairs before anybody got there. That's, again, another freezing cold day. But we got there maybe an hour before everybody else did and put 700 pieces of paper on chairs. <laughs> and then right. I spent the day at the slating convention, saw how that, all that was done because I didn't know what I didn't know what, anything about it. And... Uh, some people were nice. Two thirds of the people were nice to me. Other, others are a little dismissive, a little arrogant. Uh, now that's how they treat people. If like you're, if you're not someone in politics, they give you the little bit of. Yeah, one one guy came up to me, and said, "This is how you shake a hand." 
Now you have to understand, I, I'm like, <laughs> I'm over 50 years old and been a Marine for 23 of that. And the, the guy comes in, this is how you shake a hand. I thought, you want to die right. out? Who yeah. It? No, well, you, you'll know the name. <laughs> you would know him though. And, uh, but, uh, so, I mean, so that was a little odd, but, uh, but I looked at it and, uh, so, uh, like I say, pe people were nice, but they weren't going to slate the mayor. And, and, and as it turned out, the, the party, the new, who was, Selected was the new county chairman became Tom John and they he had somebody else in mind to run for mayor uh, It was not me because nobody knew who I was anyway. I wasn't involved in anything in any level and uh, But as it as it turned out uh, That that uh, gentleman did not uh, turn out to be the the, the guy he uh, and uh, For and then I was kind of the default candidate all the other five or six people that were thinking about it were really not going to be the guy and uh, so it kind of fell to me, even though, I mean, there's a whole story there too, but it kind of fell to me to do this. So they held a slating convention. I, I, I won that slating convention. Uh, if you, uh, so again, some was of those. Was it at the state fairgrounds? No, I can't, no, no. Was it, it was at, uh, it was at the Ben Davis fire site, uh, fire center out there okay. on the West side. And, um, uh, again, that was uh, some, some comedy uh, associated with that. And like, you can't imagine how, how all this stuff happens. Right. But, uh, and so I, and that's when I became the candidate, but uh, it, it's funny. <clears throat> I tell you about, uh, the gentleman that they did want to be the candidate. Um, we had a Wednesday night meeting. Cause his, his big deal was money. He had money. As he I was going to bring his own money. That's which, right. You know, I was a Marine uh, and two kids <laughs> in college. <laughs> that wasn't, that wasn't me. Right. I wasn't going to bring the money. Uh, but, uh, I remember specifically there was a Wednesday night meeting. Friday was the day that at the clerk's office you had to be in or out. I was already in. I had registered long uh, before. And uh, so we had a meeting Wednesday night. I had to teach a class. So I had one of those two guys that I mentioned earlier. I had him go to th that meeting for me. I got back from teaching my class. I called him up like at 815, said, uh, how the meeting go? He goes, it's still going on. I said, should I come down? He says, sure, come on down. So I, I went down. I realized, wow. I could read a room pretty well. Mm -hmm. I realized at that point in time, I'm, I'm, I'm the number two guy here and I don't know anything or anybody, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I'm the number two guy here. <laughs> and, uh, but it was clear that, uh, you know, Tom John, the new county chair wanted this guy. And I said, oh, I'm a team player. I get this completely. I'll, I'll help out where I can, whatever you want me to do. And they said, they asked me to withdraw. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll withdraw. They want to be a team. Right. Well, the next day, Thursday, an article comes out in the star and says, something uh and i i get a phone call in the afternoon <clears throat> excuse me and uh said are you gonna drop back greg i said yes sure I'll, i told you i wish she goes okay that's great i appreciate that and then two hours later i got another phone call that said are you still gonna drop out i said i told you i would yeah sure he goes, well we'd like you to stay in <laughs> we'd like you to stay in so i went to the uh uh something told me to go to the indy star website and I went to the Indy Star website, and there was, sure enough, there was a column there from the late, great Matt Tully. Mm -hmm. And if, if Matt puts that column out on Saturday or Sunday, I would have withdrawn on Friday, and you wouldn't be talking to me today because they, there's no way the party was going to select me right. with the, with the uh, methods at that time uh, because nobody knew who I was. I wasn't involved with the party whatsoever. But uh, because I was the one kind of left standing uh, on that Friday, they asked me not to withdraw and, but, if, but I was going to withdraw that Friday. And if that are, if that column comes out on Saturday, Sunday or the next Monday or something, I will have withdrawn and I'm just going with my life and nobody knows who I am. Cause I would have been out of the, out of it. Isn't that interesting how all this happens? Now, and, I, and you know, Lord knows we've spent thousands of hours together. I'd never heard that part of the story. Uh, another question about 2007 real quick. Was there a time where you were like, what did I do this for? This no, I can't win this no, guy. No, no. He's got just all this money and you know, just the opposite. Just you never got down on yourself for running. Why'd I put my wife through this? And you know, why got well, you think that? about those things, but uh, no, I never got down on myself. What I, I was actually just the opposite. I realized I was never going to be in this position again for the rest of my life. And I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can uh, to do this. That's what I told myself. And I told myself that every day, uh, not why am I doing this? It was just the opposite. I'm never going to be here again. I'm going to work my tail off to make sure this executes. Before we move on to your, your time as mayor, I'll give you three facts or three things. And you put them what you think is order importance 
to you winning. Cruciality. Taxes. Crime. Marine Corps. Ooh, you threw me off of that last one. As far as an issue, there's no question it was taxes. No, I don't think there's much question about that. Um, but I would tell you that the Marine Corps is probably uh, more important. Uh, people always ask me what was, what did the Marine Corps give you as far as being the mayor? And I, I it gives you lots of things. Obviously, I've been leading people since I was 23 years old. So I, I kind of had that down. I like to think I did. Different level of leadership, obviously, uh, that I was about to get into. But uh, I certainly had the basics of leadership down. So, But that was not the main thing. The main thing for me was focus. You, know, you get distracted a lot when you go to war, when you go into different contingency situations, and you have to realize, what are we trying to do here? What, what, where are we going? What are we trying to do? And so being the mayor, running for mayor, there's a lot of distractions, and there are people always trying to throw you off your game. And what it really did for me more than anything else was focus. It, it allowed, I, I would hear this stuff, but I stayed focused on what I was trying to do. Do you believe it helped you, however, help magnify and solidify, for example, the, your crime message, public safety's job one, that as a 23-year officer in the Marine Corps, there's an inherent tough, I mean, the Marine Corps, I was in the Army, so I hate saying this, but the Marine Corps, honestly, probably next to Long's Bakery, has the best brand in the world. <laughs> like, when you say you're in Long's the Marine Corps. Long's is pretty tough, though. Those I are really good. <laughs> but when you say you're in the Marine Corps, people just, they look at you differently. I mean, they just do. And so, but, but saying you're tough on crime as a Marine officer has a different connotation than saying you're going to be tough on crime and you were in the Coast Guard. So in that sense, do you feel that people believed that message of your campaign because he's a Marine, he's going to do what he says. He's a tough guy. Yeah, I do think so. Um, you know, I'm really a softy at heart, as you probably, as you well know, mm -hmm. uh, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think I'm, 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 I'm tough in being focused and tough in being, this is where we're going to go tough in, in the mental aspect of all of this. I don't think I, I think I am still that way. Uh, so yeah, I, I do think it has some impact. Very patriotic town, very patriotic people in the city. People trust uh, those who have served. Uh, you know, it didn't hurt to have a great family and have a great wife and kids who were down at IU and all that. I think all that was, uh, that helped also, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I do think that helped. And I like the fact that now that I'm on a podcast and I can say this, you know, you can go back 30 years and look at the murder rate, right? People think it just went up in the last few years. No, go back a little further than me. Exactly. And you'll see that there's a you there. And at the bottom of that you is four years in a row of under a hundred murders that, uh, that we were able to execute. And uh, it did rise up a little bit when I was at the end. And uh, I think the, I think uh, the current mayor has a little bit of a, you know, he's got a tough road to go with the opioids and things like that that are out there. And, uh, but uh, but go back and look, and we brought it down rather dramatically for a four-year period. We really did. When you, at what point, what do you, th when you became mayor, you know, the, the, the metaphor, or however you want to say it, is catching the tiger by the tail, right? So, so what issue or what time frame did, it, did something happen that knocked you on your heels, especially the first, like, maybe year, year and a half, where you're just... I mean, it's reasonable to think that you're learning the position and learning the city better, and it's complex as heck. I mean, everybody, I mean, there's a saying that the toughest job in the United States is the mayor of New York City. I mean, they don't say that just to make it up, but I mean, were there, can you think of a time or an issue or something that was like, okay, this is tough. This is something I didn't anticipate. Uh, tough is, might not be the right word. I, I would tell you, my first chief of staff, Paul Ocas, and who's an unbelievable guy, the best. He, he was, I love him. This is the way I describe him, and I've told him this too. He's the only guy who you can go and talk to him, and he'll tell you no, but you love him more afterwards than before. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> he has that skill set. He's As really you said serving. before, he was the, the perfect first chief of staff. No question for a guy who. And you really, had four pretty darn good ones. I had four great ones, and uh, but to get the first one there that way, who could who could tell me straight to my face? I I did not surround surround myself with yes men as uh, and yes with ladies as you well know. I had lots of people telling me, and you were one of them. Uh, but I remember one time telling uh, Paul that you know with the press, I said, "Well, let's we'll do this. Uh, just don't worry about it over here. We'll just do this." And he looks at me, and goes, "Mayor, that's a hundred percent wrong." <laughs> 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 I remember I remember when I came to the administration, my first day was November 10th, and the next day was Veterans Day Parade. It was also the day they cut the ribbon on the new airport, 
and it was the first staff meeting I was in. And I said, okay, what are you going out there? You got a speech or whatever. And you said, no, I'm not going, I'm going to the veterans parade. I'm like, you're not going to go to the cutting of the ribbon of a billion dollar airport or however much it costs. And you're like, no, I'm not going to miss the veterans parade. Scott Newman was right behind me and he goes, this is why you're here. <laughs> and you ended up going, you gave a great speech that, that the, the incomparable Jen Pittman wrote for you. She was terrific. And, uh, let me ask another question on the same lines about the administration. Cause there's a few things I want to talk about, about your post mayoral life. If you had to list your top three accomplishments, would bringing the Super Bowl to the city be one of them? Eh, no, I don't think so. I don't. I knew the just, answer to that question. Just so, <laughs> just so funny that you would ask that question because I've got a whole list of stuff here. No, actually, uh, there's lots of things. Uh, it's a I, terrific accomplishment. I mean, you, something that some of us who grew up in Indianapolis could never have fathomed that a Super Bowl would come here. So we're not downplaying it. But I know that you've always been kind of humble about it. Like, it was an amazingly terrific event, showcased the city. But is that really more important than having being the first mayor's administration to make phone calls back to citizens from the mayor's mayor's action action center boy that was fun too by the way no actually the super bowl was great don't get me wrong and i i think a lot of people saw their city differently as a result of that which i really very very much appreciate but as i told a lot of people at the time that super bowl was not the culmination of anything it was just evidence that we were doing the right things all along we the sports corp and the and the business and the non past administrations obviously Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah absolutely so and I and, and we executed it well, which is what we expected to do. So it was great. It was a great. The it was ten days were unbelievable. But no, those I, I wouldn't put that in the top three. You want me to say the top three? I, I think you should give us two. So I because uh, there's so many. <laughs> 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 I think the first actually most of them don't. The stuff that was really critically important never got any press. Well, because you ran on that in 2007, back to basics, had enough, let's get the basics of government right, you know, especially since we're the city, we're closer to the people than, you know, the state or the state department or whatever. So if we can get this stuff right. I think uh, there's three things, uh, two tangible, one not tangible, but is executing out right now. Uh, Actually, all of them still are, but uh, the sewer work that we did when we, when we inherited a $1.8 billion job which the EPA mandated on the previous administration. Uh, I know what, the, because I became, eventually became the chair of the water council for the conference of mayors. I know exactly what they were doing and they did to Indianapolis, what they did to pretty much every other city in America. When we got in, we told the EPA that we understand what you're trying to do, but here's this plan. We reworked and we're going to do it for a billion dollars and it'll be bigger. It'll be faster. It'll be cheaper and it will be greener. It'll be all of those things. And the EPA said, we don't care. Spend this amount of money. That's what they did. Mm. And that's when I found out that they were asking cities to spend 2% of their median household income not to actually fix the problem in their city. They wanted a certain percentage. Uh, They'll deny that, but that's that's actually what was (laughs) happening. And we went to court. Well, we were about to go to court. We were dancing for about a year. And then when we were about ready to go to court, the EPA came out and said, Indianapolis, you're right. You're right. We had to go to the national level because this is the regional level who was doing this to us. Sure. So at the national level, they understood it. And they had the Department of Justice with them, too. I mean, this was not just the EPA. This is the, Department, this is the EPA and the Department of Justice who were leaning on all the cities across the nation. And we pushed back. And we saved our ratepayers over $800 million right off the bat. And never got a word in the press. Nobody saw it. Only Rafael Sanchez of Channel 6 ever did an article about it. And, I mean, it was never in the paper. No one ever said it. But that was... That was the biggest engineering project, and it was the biggest you know, environmental project the city has ever done. It's still playing out right now, and by 2025, the White River will be as clean as it's ever been and forever uh, as a result of what we did. And that is uh, that was amazing project that we did, but frankly, nobody knows about it because, as uh, Raphael told me, uh, infrastructure isn't sexy. So, <laughs> Well, it's and, not. And then, I get that point. And then, and then we... Uh, then we obviously put the water and wastewater into citizens energy who continues to execute that plan. So that was, that was an amazing event in the city that will pay dividends for 50 to hundred years. And we got no press out of it, but it was a huge, huge thing that we did in the city. Can I uh, note for the record that I wasn't doing his media at that time? <laughs> so, uh, next thing is I, I think the fiscal, we, I, I inherited the, the, uh, uh, 
the mayor's office during recessionary times. And I remember David Reynolds, my first controller, he was a wonderful guy, just a just brilliant, brilliant guy. He really has any I remember him telling me in 08, 08, 09, I can't remember. He says, don't worry, Mayor, in about 11, 12, it's all going to start to turn. And you're, we're starting to have an upkeep, uptick in, uh, in revenues. Well, that never happened. When I was the mayor. <laughs> but that said, I think we studied things um, and we paid down the debt. We went from about $330 million in debt to about $110 million during a recession and uh, kept the ratings up, increased them one time. And, uh, and so... That was important to keep the borrowing costs down, obviously, but we paid down the debt. We kind of, uh, we got the, the house in order a little bit better, even during a recessionary time, and I think that was a big deal. And, I, and when we turned over uh, to the current administration, I turned over a ton of cash to those guys uh, because I knew they were going to have some trouble, too. There was a, a bit of a structural deficit in there. Not, I don't think it was much as what they said it was, but it, there, there was a bit of a structural deficit in there. And uh, But it, I left them a ton of cash to cover uh, to work work all through that and that was that was part of the deal i mean other people wanted me to spend that money right i did not spend that money uh we put something we put 80 million aside in something we call a fiscal stability fund council really wanted to spend that down and we maneuvered to make sure we didn't and uh, in addition to the other reserves that i turned over 78 of that million 78 million of that was still in there plus the other money that i left in that's and frankly that the state owed us so there was a lot of cash on hand uh, which I was proud of. I wanted them. Wanted and you them. talked about that a lot in your first yeah. campaign as well. So we were able to do that. So those, that's two. So the sewer work and then uh, I think the fiscal stability that we brought to the city during very, very tough uh, financial times nationally. And the third thing I think is uh, is who we had and what are they doing now, right? So uh, the team that I had was incredible. Uh, I had uh, you know, a former member, really prominent former member, of Luger's team come up and tell me your team was even better than ours. He told me that twice. I couldn't believe he said that because that team was a great team. And Indianapolis has a history of, of terrific people working in the mayor's office going on to do other things, whether it's Michael Connor or Susan Brooks or uh, Ryan Vaughn, uh, Michael Huber, David Harris, uh, Jim Morris, this fellow named Mitch Daniels. I mean, it's been, uh, it's been amazing. And, and we were able to continue that. And I like to think we created a whole new generation of leadership because, as you know, most of the people that worked for us were not 60 or 70. They were 30s, some 20s, right? That's right. But but look where we lead the Indiana Sports Corp. We lead the Greater Indianapolis Chamber of Commerce, Ascend Indiana, the Workforce Arm, the Mind Trust, the Education mm-hmm. uh, Organization. The, Brandon the, Brown, the Hoosier, right? the, the Hoosier Lottery. Uh, we are... Uh, the, veteran uh, strategies, veteran <laughs> session, but uh, the state civil rights commission. Uh, I mean, I I can go on and on and on, and we have number two person in IEDC, and all these are great, great people who continue to do work on behalf of the city and the state. And uh, I mean, you know all those names. I probably right. should mention all the names, but you know Ryan Vine, Chris Cotterill, and uh, Mike Huber, state budget Sarah, director Jason Dudich, Jason Dudich, state budget mm-hmm. director uh, Jim Pittman's uh, doing at One America is amazing. Uh, the list goes on and on. Like, Mark yeah. Lauder, who is you know the, at, at the a, out in dc doing his now, thing right and um you know brandon brown and jason cloth who was brilliant mm-hmm. uh, just even adam tease you know not what he's doing with iu now is remarkable we had a team that was really incredible i really i was so blessed to have so many of these people around me i really was well and I, you know it's funny too because i will tell people and then we'll talk for a few minutes about your post mayoral dominance and uh <laughs> i talk to people and you know uh, this is going to date this podcast but uh, superintendent lewis faraby has announced he's leaving to go to washington dc another incredibly effective amazing leader and you two are a lot alike introverts you know don't seek the spotlight i don't think you ever rolled up your sleeves like these politicians do for these commercials i remember i couldn't get you on a snow plow for when we did rolled out the snow fleet you remember the phrase right (laughs) No, no lame, lame photo, photo ops. ops. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted no lame photo ops. I Just wanted... what you did with buying the, the all the plows and stuff. I mean, that right. was, we had plows left over from like Hudnut or Goldsmith. Oh, I mean, they, they were archaic. They, the floorboards were, they're holes. The guys right. were freezing their tail off because the floorboards had holes in them. Yeah, they so those plate. are the kind of nuts and bolts things that we were talking about earlier. But uh, when it comes to being around the city, I had a conversation with someone who worked for mayor goldsmith and he would talk about 
uh, being downtown or being wherever in the city and to like think about how much he was involved in that. Uh, my personal experience in that would probably be the Irvington Charter High School. Remember when I came to you with Krieger Rush and said they're closing the Guardian's home? This is typical Greg Ballard, right? They're closing the Guardian's home in Irvington. You can't do that to Irvington. And without even looking up, you said, well, then do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. I walked right to Krieg and like, we can, we got to do something with that building. And I grew up right across the street. So that's particularly special to me. But when you're driving around, walking around, biking around or whatever, what are the one or two things before we move on that you look and go, man, I'm really glad to say that I was mayor and I helped nudge that along connect what i would call connectivity you heard that phrase i'm not sure anybody ever heard that phrase on the 25th floor before but connectivity the combination of the the, the sidewalks and the bike lanes and the trails and and the cultural trail and all of the things connecting up allowing people to go from point a to point b not necessarily by a car or by any, any other means but uh, the ability what i call mobility options i think it was greatly enhanced during our administration. I, and that's that's a talent attractor. Right? A lot of people are asking me, why are you doing this? Oh, my God, I can't believe it. But that's part of creating the kind of city that people want to live in. It's, it's a talent attractor, and that's why you had to do it. So it wasn't because I like to ride bikes. It was because we have to create that kind of city. So I And think, your kids influenced you on that. Yeah, my kids influenced me. on Because they were the generation. Right? They were highly educated go-getters. They're the kind of kids you yeah. want. I mean, they're the kind of people you want to live in this city. That's how they keep the city going and yeah. vibrant and all that yeah. sort of thing. Another thing that happened, I, I'm not so sure I had much to do with it, but other than kind of creating the conditions, this is a real foodie city right now. We have great restaurants. We have uh, an amazing collection of chefs that have opened up uh, restaurants. Uh, we didn't necessarily, that was not always purposeful a couple of it was but frankly that grew organically because i think we created the city that allowed that to happen so i think when we, when we look at that i'm really proud of that also now, there's lots of things physically that i mean the velodrome what what marion is now doing with the velodrome i think is pretty special and that was kind of being held up uh before and i think we got that done so now we have great events out there i mean i could point to probably lots of things like that we did a lot of work on irvington as you as you yeah. all know and i can tell you all my Castorite friends out in the east side uh who who i don't think vote republican very often but they are very praiseworthy of what you irvington's the best neighborhood in the city i'm biased obviously but but you did spend a lot and and i'll say this very quickly but uh how has how has a reunion every year it's kind of an uh it's exploded because of social media and it happens in august of 2011 and you were running for your second term, and I texted you, and there were probably three or 400 people there, and uh, how high school, and I said, come out here, come out here, and talk to these folks, and I remember you were busy, but you said, sure, I'll come on out, and you walked around, and I didn't even talk to you, I just yeah. left you alone. And I don't all think I could these, find you, as I recall. <laughs> yeah, all these people, um, everybody coming up to you, and s just not necessarily because you're, but I can hear them saying, thank you. You've been wonderful for Irvington, you know, love what you're doing for the city, whether they were R's or D's, I don't know, but you were able to have that connection specifically on the East side, which would be the part of the town I would know most about. Uh, you decide not to run for reelection in 2015 and you wanted to be impactful to the city in other ways. And one thing I want to specifically ask you about, cause then I want you to talk for a few minutes about your book is women in tech. Um, there's, a burgeoning tech sector. It's, it's beyond burgeoning now. It's established yeah, and it's yeah, got deep absolutely. roots. What made you get involved in that particular aspect of the tech world? Well, when I was done being the mayor, I, it took me about three or four months to clear my head. And Dan Taras of Guggenheim Life out there in Carmel uh, had asked me. I met him through a mutual friend. He said, I want to talk to you about what we can do. And he was gracious enough to let me clear my head because it took, it took a long time. I was all in being the mayor, I, th I think, as everybody knows. I, he said, what should we do? We want to make a difference here. And uh, I said, well, give me a few weeks. And uh, I went back and talked to a lot of people. Uh, and I, I had this thing in my mind all the time, the tech. There's not enough jobs. You know, when the governor talks about workforce development, he's exactly right. There's not going to be enough people in the, in the future for the, right, for the jobs that are going to be there. And so tech was a big deal. And there aren't, frankly, there aren't going to be enough men to fill the tech jobs in the world. And so women in tech, it's not just an equity issue. It actually is a numbers issue. There are going to be millions of jobs across the country here in about 10 years that we're not going to be able to fill unless we put more women, young women, going into tech. And so that's why we created what we did. with the, We started with the sponsoring the state robotics championships, which has an emphasis on, on girls. Uh, 
we do the seven days for middle school girls. We, we provide funding for women to go through coding academies and Ivy tech IT courses and that sort of thing. So we're able to do all that and really make a difference. And I like to say, you know, we're not an advocacy group. We actually put women in tech. Right. And we, we actually get them jobs. The last seven that graduated from the coding Academy that we help fund got jobs for 70 grand. And all you seven, have all and, seven were all picked up and you, your experience as mayor just reinforce this like you repeatedly yeah. hear it. I, I was always trying to pretty much every decision I made was about creating the kind of city that talent wants to move into and where people want to live. And then, then you have to make sure that talent has a certain skill set that brings in the companies. Tech is going to be big in that regard. And in Indianapolis and central Indiana has to be big in that regard. And we need to get more women uh, to go into tech. And that's just, I mean, that's just the way it is. And if we're going to continue our progress in, in this sector and, and STEM, generally speaking, we have to get make sure that young women, particularly uh, middle school girls and high school girls, stay focused on STEM because we're, they're, they're, when they're interested in it and, and, uh, and go in that direction. Uh, so we, we, we want to make sure they're interested in that uh, when we move into that direct, uh, so they can move in that direction if they want to. Because some, as you know, sometimes they get talked out of it. Social pressures come sure. into play. And we don't want that to happen. We want them to go there if that's where they want to go. And we want to provide them the opportunity and the training to do it all. So that's why Indy Women in Tech has been so important. And Dan and, and, uh, and the uh, ladies that I work with out there have been terrific. You've written a book. I have. It, I actually just got my first uh, couple, five copies a couple days ago. Uh, it's called Less Oil or More Caskets, as you well know. Uh, I'm always concerned about national security. I'm always, frankly, always concerned about our troops and going into harm's way. And I uh, figured out about six or seven years ago that what we're doing with oil in the world, uh, we, the United States is spending, the last estimate by, uh, by a group in D.C. was that we're spending $81 billion in this past year to make sure that oil flows throughout the world, the infrastructure and the uh, oil supply routes, and we guard it for the entire world. We do that. Uh, the funny thing is, who's, how are the terrorists funded? How is Iran? How is ISIS and Al Qaeda funded? Primarily through the sale of oil. And so this is kind of a perverse uh, situation that we have going on, which is we're protecting all these supply routes so that oil gets into these countries who then fund terrorism. So countries and organizations. So it's a uh, you know when I was in the Gulf War in '91, which is completely about oil, it uh, couldn't do anything about it. Everybody knew that was the situation. And, but until about you know five, six, seven years ago, when the new technology comes out uh, with transportation, we have to look at this because 70% of the world's oil is used for transportation, 70%. What if we didn't use gasoline and diesel in our trucks, cars and trucks? What difference would that make? It make a big difference. And uh, what upsets me is we seem to be fighting this when we should be kind of sprinting toward it. Uh, because it's our troops that are over there. We've been we've spent, well, according to a Brown University study, $5 trillion in the last few decades over there. Of course, we lost thousands of lives. Again, that was what was needed at the time. But now we have to look at it going into the future, and that's really what we're doing. And, and, and the problem is people think energy independence is really important. Now, but when you ask that next-level question, why is that, you just get a blank stare. It does keep the money in the, in the country. That's true. But, it, but the fact is that does not stop hundreds of billions of dollars going from Asia to the Middle East every year. Two-thirds of the oil that comes out of the Middle East goes to Asia. So our energy independence is irrelevant because that money will continue to go in there. And, of course, who protects the oil supply routes for all this to happen? Mm -hmm. We do. And we've been over there f for over uh, 40 years now since we took over from the British in the early 70s. We protect that for everybody. That's This is the situation that people don't know. And everybody thinks that you, the U.S. has a lot of oil. We don't have any oil. we got 2 to 3% of the oil reserves in the world at the most. We can up our production, which is what we've done right now. But the fact is everybody else is just sitting back saying, go ahead, because we've got all the oil. Right. 80% of the world's oil is in the hands of dictators, of authoritarian countries. 80%. So they don't really care if we produce our own oil or not because – we're just, they're just sitting back saying, go ahead, we've got our own oil. And that's the point of your book is that, that the, the role of the United States is promoting perversely, perhaps. Yeah, I think perversely is a good word. Uh, I hate to say it like that, but it's, it's, yeah, we're promoting that. Uh, but we're the ones responsible for the oil supply. It's not our oil, but we're the ones protecting it all. And it's our troops that pay the price. It's our taxpayer that pays the dollars. 
And we have to look at this going forward. I'm not, I'm not complaining about what's happened in the past or anything like that. What I'm saying is that we now have a new technology that allows us to change this dynamic because 70% of the world's oil is used for transportation. We should be going toward that dynamic. Uh, I, I think this is what I always say. Our, our transportation energy policy, policy should focus on these things, which is defund the terrorists, stop the enormous strategic leverage that uh, oil-rich nations have over oil-dependent nations. And the third thing is bring our troops home because our troops are going to stay over there as long as oil is a necessary strategic commodity. We need to get oil to not be a necessary strategic commodity for our economies. And once we do that, lots of things change in the world. Are you Most of it, in my opinion, is our troops come home and we stop fighting over, those, over there in the Middle East. Well, with your career in the Marine Corps, you understand better than most. I mean, my son did two tours in Afghanistan, and we all know why he's there, why he was there. Yeah. Uh, are you doing a book tour? Are you doing some speaking engagements or things in Indianapolis? Or uh, I know you're just all, out in Washington, D.C. All of the above. We're going to do some things in Washington, D.C. At the, at the end of January. The book officially comes out January 1st. You can buy it now. Less oil and more caskets. It's, it's called Less Oil and More Caskets, The National Security Argument for Moving Away from Oil. Uh, it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's on Walmart. It's Costco. It's on all. Everybody has the book already. But you won't get it until January if you order it now. So, But go ahead and order it if you want to. I appreciate it if they do that because it's a quick read. It's not a long read. I never write a long. I like to read big books, but I like to, <laughs> I like to write short books, as you know. So this is my second book. Uh, but, and it's an easy read. And it's full of facts. And I, I, I tell you, the facts are in there. And the facts are from people like the Energy Information Administration. And I mean, they're just, people don't know it. I just put the puzzle together, as I like to say. So, but uh, we'll do, we'll, we're going to tour as much as possible. We're going to get to the, t the local TV stations as much as possible. Like I say, DC, we're going to do some things in Indianapolis at the University of Indianapolis, where I'm all at also. Uh, I, I work down there also. And uh, so they're going to do some things. And so we're going to try to make it as big a hit as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one last segment, which I'm I'm hoping to use for all of my guests in this Leaders and Legends podcast that we're inaugurating here today. So um, copying off of Mr. Lipton somewhat, some forth from uh, tea? inside the actor's tea? studio. Uh, so I'm going to ask, my goal is to ask five, the same five questions of everyone uh, whom I get to interview. Is this the lightning round? It's kind of the lightning round, uh, but feel free to uh, take some time for a thoughtful answer. Because some of these things, you may have to go, oh, shoot, I don't remember. So you ready? Okay. Who did you see at your first concert? Sly and the Family Stone. <laughs> Where was that? IU. <laughs> That's good. You didn't expect that, did you? No, not at all, actually. Uh, what was your first car? A uh, 66 white Volkswagen. Did you get at, a, in a high bug, school? A bug. Yeah. Uh, no, college. College. College? Yeah. It wasn't new. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Because you graduated from college in 78? Uh, well, I was supposed to leave in 76, but yes, I left in 78. You were a member of fraternity, correct? Yes, I was. Okay, that explains that. Well, most, most got out of the wrong time. I was having fun, ran out of money, all that stuff. It's okay. <laughs> if you could have dinner with anyone in the world, who would you choose? Other than Mrs. Yeah, Bauer. and you know, you know, I always said to you and others, I, I'm not really into celebrity culture very much. So um, it doesn't have to be a celebrity. It could be Chris Spangle. It could be me. It's kind of funny because when I was, when I became the mayor, everybody asked me, "Who do you want to meet? What do you want to do this?" And I kept saying, I'm, "I don't know. I'm not in celebrity culture." And I remember telling you the two people I really wanted to meet was Jim Morris and Colin Powell. That's right. And Jim Morris now a friend. That's right. And uh, so those were the two people I most wanted to meet because Jim headed up the world food program and Colin Powell I just thought was the one guy well two now with Mitch mm -hmm. that sh that should have been president so but um, um well you've already had dinner with Jim Morris I'm assuming so and Colin Powell and Colin Powell and Colin Powell I introduced him at a Butler speaking series and uh I had I sat next to him for dinner for two hours oh uh, that's terrific that. so yeah it was oh god it was great it was great he was a wonderful guy but uh, I'm thinking somebody around the world I, but the people I really like to have dinner with are dead like Winston Churchill. Oh, okay. Mother, so no one, you mother, can't think of anyone. Mother, mother Teresa. You couldn't think uh, of anyone currently. Your favorite football player was Raymond Berry. You want to choose Raymond Berry? I met Raymond Berry. I remember here that. at a Colts game. Um, 
God, I, I may have to come back to that. Hunter. <laughs> okay. Right. If you could recommend one book to anyone, what would you recommend? Which book? Like you have to read this book or your life will be changed by reading this book. Uh, yeah. Uh, you can say your own book, by the way. <laughs> well, everybody will read my book because it's great. <laughs> uh, there's a, uh, I've read a lot of really good books. I, I um, and I still am. I still am. Uh, what was the, uh, it's a long book and people probably won't read it, but um, one, I'll give you two. Freakonomics was a really neat way of looking at things. So I think Freakonomics is good. Uh, but the Ayn Rand book, um, Atlas Shrugged. Really? Yeah. Because that's kind of a of a book, a popular book among conservative folks. I've never, I've, I have it, it. It is, but. but it says it in a different way. I mean, it's, I mean, it's a huge book, and I like to read huge books. <clears throat> Excuse me, but uh, it's it's really good. Last one before we go back to the dinner okay. one. All right. If you could have witnessed any event in history, which one would you want to witness? Wow. This is a smart show. You know, you can't just mail it in. You, you got to think. I went to four IPS schools. I mean, I should be able to get something out of this. <laughs> it took you four schools to get there. Okay. Well, they kept closing them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the... Um, I think the signing of the documents at the end of World War II on that ship. On the USS Missouri? On the Missouri, yeah. Just because the end of the war, the, who was there, the power of what it all, meant? All of the above. All of the above. It was really the, uh, well, I know what the, my next book is. I'll put it that way already. Uh, but I, I think that was a, uh, which is called Losing the Peace, which is mm -hmm. I want to do an analysis of all the documents that were signed at the end of World War One, which I think led to another century of warfare, and and still to to this day, uh, especially in the Middle East. Yeah, 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 no question. But I think that was a powerful the end of the World War Two. Uh, uh, on the Missouri was, was uh, who was there, obviously, but stunning, stunning uh, ceremony, uh, especially when General Wayne White mm -hmm. was there. That's pretty moving. And For those, then, General Rain Wright was surrendered and was part of the uh, was Corregidor or something, but was spent Batan, the whole Batan, Batan right, but right. spent the entire war as a POW, as a POW and yeah. lost an immense amount, amount of weight. weight. Yeah, he was just sticks and bones. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, uh, and held it together until MacArthur called him by his personal nickname, which was Jim. Yeah. So Wayne Wright's best friends called him Jim, even though his name was Jonathan. Right. And he held his emotions in check and... MacArthur had him at staying right behind him at the right. uh, ceremony and called him Jim and Wayne Wright, this man, two star general, I think at the time, maybe three star, all these years in a prison of war camp, started crying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, terrific. So, terrific. That's an amazing ceremony. So you got about 10 seconds to decide on dinner. Uh, well, I'm going to go with a, a good one then. Just my wife. You know, we're, we just love being with each other. I'll just say that. <laughs> How many years? Uh, 35 now. Good. And you produced two of the absolute best kids I've ever met in my entire life. Terrific kids. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Ballard, Colonel Ballard, for joining us on the very first Leaders and Legends podcast. We enjoyed the conversation immensely, and I will circulate this to all of your friends and family and former uh, associates of the administration. And when you get your next book written or you want to come talk again, please do. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it very much, Robert. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Mm -hmm.